Electrocyclic reaction is going to be the topic of this lesson, and this is the second of the types of pericyclic reactions we're going to talk about. In the last lesson, we talked about cycloadditions, and the next one we'll talk about sigmatropic rearrangements, but now we're going to deal with the electrocyclic reactions, and we'll talk about thermal conditions and photochemical conditions, we'll talk about disrotatory and conrotatory, and when a reaction is symmetry allowed and symmetry forbidden, uh, all these lovely sorts of stuff. And again, just like the uh, cycle addition reactions. This can be a little bit challenging both to teach and learn, but by the end of this lesson, I promise you're gonna have a much better handle on your electrocyclic reactions. All right, so electrocyclic reactions. So typically electrocyclic reactions are either gonna be a ring closure or a ring opening. And it turns out they're just reversible reactions. In fact, there's typically an equilibrium established and depending on the size of your ring and if it has ring strain, things of this sort, those kind of considerations will determine which will be favored, either the open chain or the ring. Cool. So. In this first example here, we're going to look at a ring closure specifically. And in this case, we're going to have the cyclic movement of pi electrons to form a ring. And so in this case, we can see that we're going to form a six-membered ring. And in this case, we'll still have pi electrons here and here. So, and then we'll get the new sigma bond here. And so we're going to have something like this. And the problem we're going to have is with stereochemistry here, because we've got a methyl group here and a methyl group here. And the, and the truth is, so far, based on what we've shown, there's no difference with our photochemical conditions as well. So we've got thermal and photochemical. What is going to be different, though, is the stereochemistry. I'm going to erase these straight line bonds and draw in wedges and dashes in a little bit, uh, and we'll see the difference. Now, how we predict this, uh, we'll see here with uh, uh, orbital symmetry and things of this sort. So now one thing to note here is this is not like a cycloaddition where we have two reactants. We just have one reactant. And so we don't have to like draw the homo of one and the lumo of the other. With an electrocyclic reaction, you're just going to involve the highest occupied molecular orbital of your only reactant. And so it's all about the homo, not about the lumo. All right, in this case, uh, you're going to want to figure out your symmetry there as well, whether it's symmetric or anti-symmetric. And notice again, psi 1 is always symmetric, then psi 2 is anti-symmetric, and psi 3 here, an odd number, will also be symmetric. And just as a reminder, the odd ones, psi 1, psi 3, psi 5, are symmetric. The even ones, psi 2, psi 4, psi 6, are anti-symmetric, and that will be super helpful. And so under thermal conditions here, we've got psi 3, which is symmetric as our highest occupied molecular orbital, and so we're going to draw him up here. Now, just like with the cycloadditions, though, again, you're probably going to be on the hook for having to draw the entire psi 3 on there. However, in terms of predicting stereochemistry, the only part that really matters is the ends. And knowing that it's symmetric, I'm only going to draw the ends in here. And being symmetric, they just match. Now, if you got the study guide handy, I drew the entire psi 3 molecular orbital there. So you could see it. But again, the only part that I really need for predicting the product and the stereochemistry product is just those ends. And so it turns out what's going to happen when you form a new bond right across the middle here is it turns out that the molecular orbital at the ends is going to rotate in one way, shape, or form. And when it rotates, we're trying to get constructive overlap to create that new sigma bond we're forming right there that ends up in the product right there. And so we're actually going to rotate the ends of the molecular orbital here in one way, shape, or form to cause that to happen. Now what we're going to do here is rotate this either clockwise or counterclockwise on the left-hand side, and then just match it up on the right-hand side so that we get constructive overlap. And what I want to have happen here is we want to turn these, and let's say I rotate this one clockwise in such a way, and then this one I'd have to rotate either clockwise or counterclockwise, and we're going to try and get constructive overlap where they've rotated. In this case, either both blue as I've drawn it or both green, and it could be either way, which is why we typically end up with two options for how to accomplish this. And so in this case, let's just say I choose to rotate this end of the molecular orbital clockwise so that it would put the blue region into the middle. And again, I could have chosen counterclockwise, which would put the green region into the middle. So either way works. It's arbitrary. But once you've chosen one side, the other side has to rotate in such a way that it puts the same phase in the middle there. And so in this case, if the blue is in the middle, then I need to rotate this one in such a way that the blue ends up in the middle. And in this case, I can see that instead of rotating it clockwise, it'll be counterclockwise instead. So the one on the left I chose clockwise, the other one ends up 
counterclockwise. Now, had I chose the one on the left to be counterclockwise, this one would have ended up clockwise, and they both would have put the green portions in the middle. As long as it's in phase and constructive overlap in the middle, great, that's exactly what we need to accomplish. But we have a name for this. When one side is clockwise and the other side is counterclockwise, when they're opposites, we call this disrotatory. So, and you can see here that if the ends of your molecular orbital match, so to speak, well, then it's going to have to be disrotatory. So the converse of this is what we call conrotatory. So disrotatory is like this. So kind of like how a lot of British windshield wipers wipe. So conrotatory, on the other hand, is when they both go clockwise or both go counterclockwise, like a lot of American windshield wipers work. So, and if disrotatory here is, we figured this out, that's what we mean really to say is that disrotatory is allowed which then means that conrotatory is forbidden. So kind of similar to what we saw at the cycloadditions where we said, well, if suprafacial, suprafacial is allowed, well then suprafacial, anterofacial is forbidden under certain conditions. Well, in this case, under thermal conditions where we're using psi three, which is the homo, so disrotatory is allowed and conrotatory would be forbidden. And once again, because something is forbidden, doesn't mean it doesn't happen. It just means it's probably not the major product. All right. So in this case, with rotating this one counterclockwise, it puts the blue region in the middle, we get that constructive overlap, and life is good. Now, one thing to note, if you notice, when I rotated, I showed two arrows for both lobes to kind of show the overall rotation uh, clockwise, because a lot of students do this, and they would just draw that one arrow, and they say, it rotates to the right. Well, you gotta be careful what you define as right and left, because this one looks like it's going to the right, this one looks like it's going up to the left, you know, so right and left aren't the most descriptive terms, but clockwise and counterclockwise, probably what you wanna use here. And when I see that one's clockwise, one's counterclockwise, that's what disrotatory means. And again, if they were both clockwise or both counterclockwise, that's what conrotatory would mean. Now, the reason this is important is because now we're gonna use it to predict stereochemistry. And so look at your methyl groups here. And just like we did with diels alder we're gonna define them as being either out or in. And to kind of help us figure that out, I'm gonna draw in the relevant hydrogens here. There's a hydrogen right there and a hydrogen right there. And so if you had to define the methyl and the hydrogen, one is in and one and out, well, the methyl group would definitely be the out position in both cases. So they are both out in this case. That's the main point here. So. What that would mean if you're drawing them on the molecular orbital picture here. So this is just plain one, one, three, five hexatriene, but we've got these extra methyl groups, but they both point out. So one's there and then one points out on the other side. Neither one pointed in toward that region. That's where the hydrogen's pointed. Well, what's nice is when you look at your rotation, and again, this is why I draw two arrows. Now I can see on this side that this methyl group's gonna get pushed up. And when it gets pushed up, that means it's gonna be a wedged bond on the product. Whereas this one over here also gets pushed up, which means it's also going to be a wedged bond on the product. So I get two wedged bonds here, and these end up cis to each other. All right, now had we chose to go counterclockwise here and clockwise over here, well then these would have both ended up dashed bonds and you get the opposite version of this. Well, in this case, this is a meso compound, so whether they're both wedges or both dashes, it's the same meso compound. But had it not been a meso, then I would have drawn out two products. All right, so this is kind of the deal, and this is kind of nice and convenient as well because if you look here, so here they both pointed out and they end up cis. Now this is not a cycloaddition, but that's what Diels Alder did as well. And if you recall, Diels Alder uh, uh, dealt with six pi electrons in motion. And here we've got six pi electrons in motion. And, and it turns out we can make a broader principle here that this is what we typically see for four N plus two pi electrons moving in the transition state. We've got to define them moving in the transition state as we'll see in a minute. It's not just the number of pi electrons necessarily in the system, but the number moving in the transition state. Again, that'll be important in a minute. And we see here that if they're both out or both in, they're gonna end up cis on the product and had one been out and one been in, they'd be trans in the product under thermal conditions, just like we saw with Diels Alder. So it's convenient to kind of relate this back to Diels Alder, even though this is not a cycloaddition, but an electrocyclic, because as far as stereochemistry is concerned, it's totally analogous. Now, if we look at what happens with photochemical conditions, well, again, with photochemical conditions, we are gonna promote an electron here from psi three to psi four, and if all of a sudden we promote an electron up there, well, then we can't call psi three the highest occupied molecular orbital anymore. It would now be psi four. 
So under photochemical conditions, we now have psi 4 as the highest occupied molecular orbital, and that is anti-symmetric, not symmetric. And so when we go to draw this out again, so now being anti-symmetric, and again, I could draw the whole thing in, and on your study guide, it's there. But again, the only part that really matters to me are the ends. And being anti-symmetric, they don't match. Now, before we even show the rotations, I'm going to preemptively draw in our methyl groups, which again, point both out. So we'll put one out over here, one out over here. But now, once again, we want to rotate the ends of the molecular orbital here, this end and this end, either clockwise or counterclockwise, to lead to constructive overlap in the middle. And again, I like, you know, usually I'm pretty systematic about this, and I just pick the one on the left first, and I make it go clockwise almost every time. But you could pick the one on the right first, or you could pick the one on the left to go counterclockwise. It's really arbitrary, the first one. So but this is what I do, one on the left, going clockwise. And I can see that that methyl group is going to get forced up. It's going to be a wedge in the product. That's the first part. And so in this case, if you notice, if I rotate this around like so, that one right, that methyl group right there is that methyl group right there. And so I can see that it's possible for it to get a wedged position. So, but on the other side here, I can see that if the blue region is going to be out facing the middle, we're forming the new sigma bond, then to get the blue region on this one facing that same place, so I'll need to rotate this one also clockwise. So now they're both clockwise, which means this is not disrotatory, this is conrotatory. And so now it's conrotatory that would be allowed and disrotatory that would be forbidden. I can also see where that other methyl group's going, that other methyl group on the other side. Notice that again, this is why I make sure to draw both arrows to show the complete circular motion. I can see it's getting forced down and is going to be a dashed bond. So, and in this case, this is not a meso compound. Now there's no plane of symmetry down the middle. And so I get both versions, both enantiomers in this case. And so in this case, I chose to have them both rotate clockwise, which put the blue shaded regions overlapping in the middle to form the new bond. But I could have had them both go counterclockwise, which would still be conrotatory, and it would have put the green regions out in the middle. And then two methyl groups would have ended up in exactly the opposite positions. And so that's why if you do form a chiral compound, you do get the two enantiomeric versions of it uh, with these ring closures. Now, one thing to note, and I said it was important to, when you're counting your pi electrons to count the number moving in the transition state, not the number in your reactant, because these reactions are reversible. So if I was gonna reverse this reaction to go back to my open chain here, what I would do is just undo the arrows we did to close it. And so the mistake students will often make on a ring opening is they count their pi electrons and they're like, oh, two, four pi electrons, great. Well, it's not again the number of pi electrons necessarily in the reactant, it's the number moving in the transition state, which is two, four, six. That's the important part. And so with it being six again, psi three would end up uh, having been the homo under thermal conditions anyways, going back. And, and again, just wanna make sure you count your electrons correctly on a ring opening. The ring closure, students don't have a problem with. It's the ring opening that's tricky. All right, so also with, if you're doing a ring opening, I highly recommend you just do it backwards. So instead of doing the ring opening, do the ring closure, do the reverse reaction. So, and use, pick your reactant, you know, to just pick randomly, whether they're both out or one out, you're know, both in or one out, one in, and then see if it leads to your product under your conditions, either thermal or photochemical. If it does, then you by chance got the right relationship. And if it doesn't, then you need to switch it. If you chose both out or both in and it works, fantastic. If you chose both out and both in and it doesn't work, then you need to switch it to one out and one in instead. All right, so this again was a six pi electron transition state, which is a four n plus two number. And what we've now determined is that under thermal conditions, disrotatory is allowed, conrotatory forbidden. Under photochemical conditions, conrotatory is allowed and disrotatory forbidden. Another generalization we could make is that psi three was symmetric and with a symmetric molecular orbital, it's disrotatory that needs to happen. That's allowed, therefore conrotatory be forbidden. Whereas in the photochemical conditions, we're using psi four star, which is anti-symmetric. And for an anti-symmetric orbital, it is conrotatory that needs to happen and it's conrotatory that would be allowed. Therefore, disrotatory would be forbidden. Now, these generalizations we've made are for four n plus two pi electrons, numbers like two electrons, six electrons, 10 electrons. If you recall, an odd number of pairs is another way to look at that. 
cool when we do this in multiples of four. So a four N number of pi electrons, as we're about to here in a second, then it's all flipped. We'll find under that, the, uh, you know, where something where we're only moving a multiple of four pi electrons, an even number of pairs, that actually it's going to be disrotatory. Uh, that is forbidden under thermal condition to be conrotatory allowed. And under photochemically, it wouldn't be conrotatory allowed. It'd be disrotatory that would be allowed and conrotatory forbidden. It's all flipped when you're dealing with an even number of pairs of pi electrons, a multiple of four pi electrons. Let's take a look at an example. All right, in this next example here, we're going to do another ring closure. But in this case, where it's only going to be involving the movement of four pi electrons in the transition state with only four pi electrons in our conjugated system. So in this case, then, it is psi 2 that is the highest occupied molecular orbital. And recall that psi 1 is symmetric, psi 2 is anti-symmetric. And if we do it under photochemical conditions, then we'd promote an electron, it would be psi 3 star. That would be the new highest occupied molecular orbital, and it would end up being symmetric, as we'll see here in a minute. So but let's go back to psi 2 here being our HOMO under thermal conditions, and it's anti-symmetric. And again, you could draw the entire psi 2 molecular orbital, and it's on your study guide. However, the only part that matters for predicting stereochemistry in your product is just the ends here, where the new bond, the new sigma bond is going to be created. And so in this case, with it being anti-symmetric, means the ends don't match. So when you've got an anti-symmetric molecular orbital, we learned that that's when conrotatory is allowed and disrotatory is forbidden. So before we rotate this, we could draw in where our methyl groups are. And if you look back on your reactant here, this methyl group is out. There's a hydrogen pointing in. This methyl group is in. There's a hydrogen out over here. And so one, one methyl group is out, one methyl group is in. I only drew those hydrogens in so we could make sure we knew what out and in meant. So, but one's out, one's in. And a couple different ways you can look at this. So one thing I do is I say, okay, one's out, one's in. What would Diels Alder do with that? Well, Diels Alder with one out and one in, Diels Alder would make them trans. But Diels Alder is for 4n plus 2 pi electrons. We're dealing with 4n pi electrons. And so under thermal conditions, we're going to do opposite of what Diels Alder would do, which happens under thermal conditions, and then the exact opposite of that under photochemical conditions. And so one thing we could do without even looking at the molecular orbitals, we could just say, okay, well, we're going to form a four-membered ring. So in this case, one out, one in, Diels Alder would make them trans, but that's a 4n plus 2 number of pi electrons. This is only a 4n, and so we're going to make them cis. Whether we make that both wedges or both dashes, it does not matter. And it's a meso, and so instead of drawing two products, it's just the one meso compound, again, whether you made them wedges or dashes. So you could predict that right off the bat. And if you do it under photochemical conditions, well, then it should be the opposite of that. And these should end up trans. And this is not a meso compound, so you're going to get a pair of enantiomers. But I haven't really actually shown you how to predict these products like from a conceptual standpoint. It's just memorizing some things and, you know, pattern recognition. And we know what Diels Alder does. And it, does it do the same as Diels Alder? Well, if it's 4n plus, pi two, uh, 4n plus 2 pi electrons moving in the transition state, then yes, it does. So at least under thermal conditions. But if it's 4n pi electrons, then under thermal conditions, it would result in what's the opposite of the Diels Alder. All right. So again, that's just pattern recognition. But let's take a look again in our molecular orbital, see what's really going on. And in this case, again, we've got the one as we rotate this on the right is the methyl group pointing out. So, but the one on the left is going to be the methyl group pointing in. So one's out, one's in. And now we'll see that it's got to be conrotatory. But again, we memorized that, but we can see why that has to be here with this being anti-symmetric. And if I take the one on the left, and again, I tend to make the one on the left first go clockwise. Well, that's going to put the blue region out in the middle where we're forming the new bond. So to make sure the blue region on this one overlaps in the same region to get constructive overlap, in phase overlap. So I can see that this one also needs to go clockwise. And because they're going in the same direction, both clockwise or both counterclockwise, that's again what conrotatory means. And once again, that was just a generalization we made too, that with an anti-symmetric orbital, the only way you get constructive overlap is with conrotatory uh, rotation here. So cool. If you notice what happens then too, is that 
The methyl group here on the left is going to get forced down and be a dash. The one on the right also is going to get forced down and be a dash. And so they're going to both end up cis to each other as dashes. So, but again, I chose clockwise and clockwise. Had I chose counterclockwise and counterclockwise, then it'd be the opposite. And both methyl groups would have been forced up. The key is, is they're going to end up cis. And in this example, that's a meso compound. So it didn't matter whether, again, I made it both wedges or both dashes. Now in the other example here, so now, once again, we are going to promote an electron under photochemical conditions from psi 2 up to psi 3. And so psi 2 is no longer the highest occupied molecular orbital, it's now psi 3 under photochemical conditions, and it's symmetric. And if it's symmetric, it means the ends of the molecular orbital match. And again, you can draw the whole thing and you might be on the hook for doing so on a test or something. It's on your study guide, but I'm not going to do it here. Again, my point here is just to predict stereochemistry. But like I said, the whole thing is on your study guide. And once again, so the one on the right as we rotate this is going to point out the methyl group on the right. But the methyl group on the carbon on the left is going to point in. Well, with a symmetric molecular orbital, it's going to have to be disrotatory to get constructive overlap. So we say that disrotatory will be allowed, which means conrotatory would be forbidden. And once again, I'm going to rotate the one on the left clockwise. And that's going to cause this methyl group to go down. It's going to put the blue region in the middle. And to get constructive overlap, then on the other side, I'd have to rotate counterclockwise. And with one clockwise, one counterclockwise again, that's why disrotatory is allowed. Cool. We can also see that one methyl group is going to be forced down and be a dash. The other one's going to be forced up and be a wedge. They're going to be trans to each other in the product. And again, I chose clockwise and counterclockwise. I could have chose counterclockwise and clockwise. And that's why you get both enantiomers in this case. Cool. So we've got a couple of different ways of predicting products. If you know your deals all the real well, all your cycloadditions and your electrocyclics, based on the number of ele pi electrons moving in the transition state, you can actually compare them to what you know about Diels-Alder, which a lot of students do. However, if you draw in your molecular orbitals involved, whether it be cycloaddition or electrocyclic, you can figure out just by looking whether your molecular orbital is symmetric or anti-symmetric, you can figure out whether you need uh, disrotatory motion for constructive overlap to occur, in which case disrotatory would be allowed and conrotatory forbidden. Or if it's the opposite, because you have an anti-symmetric molecular orbital, then conrotatory would be allowed and disrotatory forbidden. Similar things with figuring out whether it's superfacial, superfacial, or superfacial and terafacial back with the cycloadditions. So but this is kind of the deal. Hopefully, you've got a much better grasp on these electrocyclic reactions than you did 10 minutes ago.